thank you very much uh, for this and especially for, for writing such a, a wonderful uh, dissertation. Um, it has been uh, a, a great pleasure to read it uh, and also to discuss it with the, with the community. Um, uh, when you uh, see uh, on the front page that this is a PhD dissertation, you sometimes, you know, have the expectation that this is the work of a perhaps trying, slightly fumbling young scholar. Uh, but but you immediately forget that once you get into the text because this uh, text is is uh, is full of clarity and and confidence um, and it's also uh, I think what what I really appreciated about it is that that this is a text that does so many things at once it has got very clear language and arguments and metaphors and it, you have these lovely little data experiments and you produce a bunch of really instructive. Uh, uh, visualizations. Uh, you uh, tell an interesting uh, background history about how Gaifu came into being, and you reflect into the future, and you engage with all sorts of literature. So this is this is really, as as you said, you are a jack of many trades, and that really comes through. So this is a very uh, rich uh, uh, piece of work and and rich piece of, of writing uh, that is interesting in, in a lot of different ways, um, and also. Um, uh, speaking as an SCS scholar, I would like to, to echo what, what, what Brit said, uh, that this is really uh, SCS at its best. Um, and and uh, I think SCS is a field that, uh, as you know, it's, it's quite an unruly interdisciplinary field. Oh, yeah. But what has always uh, sort of uh, energized the field of SCS is that, that all sorts of uh, strange people uh, have been coming into the field. So, so people who have different backgrounds, we've been, been blessed by people like, say, Donna Haraway, who was a biologist by training, or Bruno Latour, who was a philosopher, or maybe a biblical scholar by training, and uh, engineers, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, people from anthropology, ethnology, all sorts of different fields have come into this field and, and joined the mm -hmm. conversation. Um, so, so I think it's really the lifeblood of STS that it, it keeps attracting strange people that do strange things in, in slightly strange ways to, to our field. Um, so, so even though it's not sort of a traditional STS, um, uh, STS uh, type of text, it, it definitely has the, the very traditional spirit of STS and, and mm. the kind of energy. Um, so, so I think that's, that's, that is really wonderful. Um, I also want to, to, to emphasize um, that um, uh, what, uh, what, what, what Bernard also mentioned that this is a, a text that does a lot of work of trying to uh, create um, a, a conceptual uh, practice around visual network analysis. You, you are very uh, keen to sort of invent clear language and clear ways of talking about these difficult things. Um, uh, and what I also like is that, that in this process you are uh, in a sense making a conversation space for all of us to enter, but you're also making um, a, a space for uh, for for you as a toolmaker for for what to um, what to think about. You you sort of enlarge in um, enlarge the space of what a toolmaker can do and reflect on, and and in the process you also uh, enlarge the space for users. You I like very much that you said that in a sense people are uh, legitimized to abuse your tools. Um, um, I, I kind of hadn't expected you to say that, <laughs> but, but it, it seems that that, uh, that, that in, in a certain sense you've been on, on a long travel to, to coming to that. It's, it's certainly a, a, a rather unusual statement for an engineer, um, I can say, um, being the son of an engineer. Uh, but um, so the, uh, the, the question that, um, or the first question that, that I want to ask you is, uh, is a question that we also stated in the in the assessment, and it's about uh, how to think about uh, data exploration. Data exploration is sort of the uh, pretty much the answer to many of the of, of the difficulties and and the things you're struggling with. Um, so obviously, we shouldn't see data visualizations as as a sort of positivist accounts of what is actually there. Instead, we should see data visualizations as tools or occasions for uh, exploring data, um, uh, figuring things out, raising hypotheses, and so on. Um, and and we're, um, what we're writing uh, in, in the commentary is, is that 
uh, that, that we are interested in how you might reflect on what is this process of exploration actually. And, and we're giving you sort of um, maybe a, a slightly critical yeah. account of, of one of your articles, um, uh, the one called, what do we see when we look at networks? Um, and in that article, maybe, you know, you can object to my account of it, but, but, but what you're doing there is that, that you are uh, gathering uh, a large amount of, of, of data on, on gas, uh, gas yeah. positions, labels, uh, genres, and so on, on, on Wikipedia. Uh, and then you are uh, playing the, 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 full, uh, the full scale of, of, of network visualization tools. So you are uh, uh, sort of uh, specializing and color coding and uh, sizing the networks and you know, exploring it in different ways. Um, uh, and you sort of show all the all the creativity and the muscles of the of, of visual net of the craft of visual network analysis that, that you have that you have equipped and developed um, and but then what you come up with is is uh, in the paper is is a kind of explanation where you say uh, the network that we, this visual device that we have here it looks like this because because of uh, how uh, certain things are in the jazz community. So, so just to to quote one sentence from your from your text, uh, vocalists such as Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday are positioned toward the center because of their numerous collaborations. So, so the the, the critical account of, of what you're doing here is that that you are drawing on external knowledge about what is Billie Holiday doing to explain. Uh, why the network uh, looks like it does. And one might say that, you know, a typical practice, at least for social science, would be to look at some data to explain something about the jazz phenomenon out there or the world out there. So, so, so the, the critical question here is, is data exploration really about Picking knowledge from the world outside to explain why the network looks in this strange way, or is yeah. network exploration a process that leads you to uh, understand or engage with things out there? But, you know, yes, the division between in here and out there, and you know, we can problematize probably everything I said here. But mm -hmm. I hope you get the direction of my uh, yes. curiosity here about you know what what are you actually talking about when you're talking about data exploration? Yes, I think that's a, a very good question. And I, I would start by saying that I think that your, your criticism of the paper is justified. Um, I could explain why it's like that, but I don't think that's the most interesting because I think that the, this criticism uh, leads to something that's important and that might be something we can uh, improve. So I want to take a step back and talk about um, why we come up with this um, the importance of this notion of exploration. And it, it really comes from John Tuckey, where he opposed the exploratory use of statistics, and we extend that to data visualization, but that's kind of the same thing, compared to confirmatory use. So the first move there was to, to, to say and to make it valid that visualizing is not always to, for evidence or for, which is a, a very naive understanding of what it is to see in a paper. But actually, the way he, he said that, because he observed the practices, he said, in practice, people use the visualizations to find their hypothesis. And then if you know that, it changes a number of things. He had very specific concerns. For instance, he said, if what you prove has been a hypothesis that you have found with your own data, then of course it's going to work. So you are trapping yourself into something that may be completely wrong. There are other ways to say that, but so the first move was to, was to make it clear to uh, the, the audience of statistician out there that exploration is, is different from confirmation and this demarcation was super important. Now, maybe we are there because the way, that's kind of what we try to do for networks, but that's possible that we are there because if you look closely, first of all, there is kind of a continuum between exploration and building visualizations for others. And even though there are very distant practices, when, when you visualize for yourself, when you're alone and you strongly engage with the data, and on the other hand, the visual communication to convey a clear and simple message to an audience, these two are completely opposite 
parts of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But not only is there a whole continuum, but our growing acculturation to visualization makes us more and more hungry for a little bit more complex visualizations. For instance, in the field of uh, sports journalism, people are very hungry for a lot of stats and articulation between different things and so on. So the, the demarcation doesn't hold for that reason, but also because we, we want sometimes to produce visualizations like datascapes that we want the audience to engage with and explore. This way we'd have kind of a funnel strategy where they have a not exploratory entry point that becomes exploratory if they want to engage more. But, but, but this thought for an external audience, not for yourself. And, and then what is exploratory? Even that sphere is multiple things. And I think that the reason why we maintained this dichotomy was under the idea that it was necessary, but maybe it's not. And I think it's the destiny that the more this issue is understood, the less the dichotomy is a solution and the more it becomes a problem by itself. And I agree that it might be now more productive instead of having like this kind of caricatural uh, distinctions to be more precise about the practices because you're right, the, I mean, the, the two simple narratives you can craft depending on who you're talking to are um, the, net, the, the visualization is explained by the relations or the visualization is explained by the algorithm depending on if you write a paper algorithm or if you write a, an, an article about the data that you visualize. Because I say that because that paper you talk about, we try to talk about the process itself. That's why we explain the algorithm with the visual and not the contrary. But none of those is valid anyways, because the interplay of the two is actually, as, as you've seen, very complicated. And it's not one explaining the other. Like both versions are wrong. And if that's clear to everyone, then we can say more interesting things. So I think that maybe we are in this moment now where we go beyond the exploratory, confirmatory dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so how, I mean, um, if you think about how, say, imagine a sociologist wants to investigate some kind of phenomenon, this, I mean, we could take the phenomenon of jazz. So, so, uh, you know a lot more about jazz than I do, but, but imagine sort of a, a musicologist or a sociologist of, of, of music, you know, at, could you s imagine something about, you know, at what point yeah. would, would that person be sort of uh, using data visualization, uh, explorative, simply yeah. explanatorily or in otherwise, and, and at what points, how would that sort of interface with other research practices? Um, I think that a, a healthy strategy here would be for someone who has no knowledge of networks, but a lot of knowledge on, let's say, jazz, and has a jazz network to analyze, would be to look at the algorithm as something empirical. So for that to work, it has to be clear what's the domain of the algorithm, what, what it's taking as an input and what it's giving as an output, basically. It has to be clear that it looks at the relations in the data and that it outputs positions. But the way it outputs that, I think the most productive way to engage with that is to say, we don't really know, we're going to look at that empirically. And by that, I mean, then you need a counterpoint because you, you, you accept that you need to explain both um, the algorithm and, and the data. Mm. You can't just assume that you know the algorithm and then understand the underlying data by looking at it. Basically, you have the image is going to give you a hypothesis, but you can never take them for face value. But it doesn't mean that you can't take them seriously. So you're, you're trying to consolidate that with a counterpoint, which might be either having other strategies uh, that can be variations. For instance, you could have ego networks, where you reduce that whole complexity to a smaller case with one node and its neighbors, and then it's easier to read and you can scale down and have more precise, that you can fall back onto diagrammatic um, interpretation regime, for instance, by doing that. Or you could look at other things, uh, like, I don't know, in this case, it was Wikipedia data. You could actually read the articles mm -hmm. and, and then you would need to walk on two feet. One of the, those is the networks and the other one is not. Which means, and it's super important, that the network in this case will never be just the view you use to get the knowledge because it's not sufficient. Mm. And I think it's clear that you can't really deeply understand these objects anyways. So if you, you can't just see through them, you have to have another 
uh, landmark, un point d'appui, uh, another ground mm. to ensure the solidity. Uh, yeah, and then it's exploratory if you want, in the sense of being fruitful. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, good points. Um, I think um, I think it would be uh, sort of um, an, an obvious sort of um, sort of successor of the project that you have to, to try to explore sort of more of the scenarios of use in, in, in a different way. You know, so so uh, how do you move in and out the use of the visual methods? Uh, how where in different stages of a research process, different styles of researchers, different kinds of uh, uh, problems or crises in the process of a, of a research project. How, how could you imagine um, uh, net network visualization playing a part or being a resource at, at various points? I think that, that could be really, really interesting to to unpack on on a larger scale with some you know, sort of well-chosen case studies, perhaps, uh, I think. Um, yeah, but I think that if your ultimate goal is not to build a very solid fact in a paper, hmm. then there is a very comfortable way to stay with the trouble of, of the layout and not try absolutely to, to find a ground, just live with it the way it is. It means that you can't assess evidence easily, but not everything is about assessing evidence. There are things that might be fringe between art and research or things that you want as, as an experience because it's very um, bodily to look and interact with the network in some ways. Mm -hmm. And this might be fruitful even in the, in the frame of science in other ways than publishing papers. Mm -hmm. So there might be an enjoyment in, a, in doing network stuff. Mm -hmm. and front, ways, yeah. yeah, but yeah. The, the, the clear example is an elicitation device. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, just imagine you print someone's Facebook network, GDPR, the questions aside, and then you ask them to talk about that, their friends and their family, and while using that, they will they will say very different things than if you don't have that support, and then maybe the details don't really matter. It's just a way to sh to make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's a really interesting notion to throw into the part here, the elicitation <laughs> device. Yes, yeah. I mean because what you're eliciting is is uh, is, is you could elicit. Uh, uh, questions or concerns with the people you study, but also with you as a researcher, or uh, oh, yeah. it, it, you could elicit the uh, challenges between you and the toolmaker, or you know. So, so, uh, so to think of data visualization as, as something that elicits um, sort of certain concerns or questions is, is really an interesting addition to, to all the things that you have been saying here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Then I want I want to comment that. Uh, I agree with the criticism of network maps that it's dangerous. And, but also it, it can be very productive precisely because it's dangerous. I mean, it's dangerous because it, it enacts things. So if it works, there are ways to use it. But then we have to stop being afraid of that and systematically see it as the Trojan horse, as, as Joanna Drucker says, of, I don't know, quantitative methods or physicists who want to modelize the social. Networks can be very different things than that. But I don't know if they have succeeded in building that kind of trust with the uh, social science scholars, but maybe that's possible. And then they may have very different uses of that than, I don't know, uh, network scientists. Yeah, yeah. So if only we could get rid of the positivist interpretations, then we would have more time to play. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so. Okay. Um, ten minutes. Um, okay. I will. Um, then go to the next question, and this is a question that, that you already touched upon with, with bit. The, the, um, you're saying that we should be building um, uh, complexoscapes rather than mm. uh, complexoscopes. And I, I wonder if you could just tell us something about some of the complexoscapes that you have been building. And I'm also very okay. curious about what you know about how do users actually engage with these and, you know, so, um, yeah. so. So tell us something about that, please. I want to show you something then. Do you know Distill, the online journal? It's, it's a journal. Um, I hope you can see my screen. It's a, it's a journal dedicated to, you may say, datascapes. Mm -hmm. So this is a paper. Sometimes it looks like an interface, uh, an, an interface uh, a software. 
then we have the paper, the references, images. In some sense, it looks like a paper. And in, in some sense, it looks like a tutorial for visualization. This has been produced by uh, the Google Brain team. So, I mean, there is, a, there is a strong argument in there. I just want to, they present what they call an activation atlas. Mm -hmm. This is a good example, I think, of a complexoscape. And I think I could show datascapes like the ones we, we have developed at the Sciences Po Media Lab, that you also probably know. But this makes an even stronger case because it's even clearer that what's behind here is very far away from, you, from us. We are so far away from understanding what's at play that just making the list of the layers of mediations we invent to touch that is mind blowing. So it's about machine learning. That was part of, of, of your questions. Mm -hmm. um, so machine learning, deep learning, we have a multi-layered neural network that's been trained to analyze and tag images. And you could ask it to get, get the tags for an image or to produce an image with a tag and all of these things. But the question is, how does it work? How do we know, um, um, for instance, if we're going to have a good or bad image, what, what's going to, how is the image produced? Let's say you ask for a boat and you get a cat, why? Where in the, in the, okay. So the standard position is that it's a black box. We can't really know whatever, but people want to know. And actually, if you get into the nitty gritty of how it's done and you give yourself the, the way to understand that you can, but the price, so this is an activation at last. So unless you have the layers and each layer, it's a bunch of neurons. But if you represent the neurons themselves, uh, it doesn't help you. So the way it works is that for each neuron, they've tried to construct a typical image. But then if you had all this bunch of images, it would be too complicated to understand. So then they run an algorithm that is kind of a network visualization algorithm. It's Disney in this case, for those who know, there's a network visualization hidden in there. And with this Disney, they put together the images that are close, and then it makes you this kind of geography. If I unzoom, can I zoom? Yeah. So each layer has its own space that has been reconstructed by an algorithm which already involves um, dimensionality reduction strategies like the one I have shown. So already for each layer, it's already super complicated. And it, if you zoom into each layer, you're going to see different images produced by the neurons. Right? So here we see like, this is an orange, orange, so in, in the Makara. So you can see how the vocabulary transforms from one foot to another here or from other things. Let me show you what they say. For instance, you can see they say buildings somewhere. Let's jump to the buildings. OK. And you can see how the labels are reacting with the visualizations and on the different layers. Because as you know, some, the, the, more, the deeper you get into the layer, the more you see the details and so on. And that's just the, scratching the surface. Because what you do with that then is you, you try to understand which neurons activate when you give a certain input. Let me scroll down to that kind of things. That's where it really gets useful. Yeah, because yeah, you give an input and then certain parts of that space will react, mm. right? So the way you would use that is if you have a specific question, such as why is this output like that, then you can retrace how it was built in the system. And there are layers and layers of mediation that try to help you make sense of these completely abstract spaces in practice. And then you have to spend some time to engage deeper with the data, especially because, and they explained that, I, I don't want to re-explain all the papers, but the problem of each neuron is that the typical Im image of the neuron doesn't tell you much because it's the interplay between the neurons that is really important. So this way you can put the whole network in a specific situation and see how each network reacts to the other networks and it gives you a certain kind of images. And this way, step by step, you can build your understanding of that. So the scenario here for you to understand a given input, it's rich, but I mean, if I had to exp I mean, all my thesis is one thin slice of all that mess. That's what I mean. I mean, <laughs> that's a complex escape, but in some ways it works. Mm -hmm. And in some way it's much better than saying, uh, deep learning is a black box. Mm. Now we, we can, it's just a question of yeah, cost benefits.
that's great. It costs a huge amount of money to produce that and that paper by itself. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, but I wonder. I mean, so the way I understand complex escapes is is that they're also um, uh, um, <coughs> it's an invitation for external users to come in and play around and explore stuff, right? Um, um, <laughs> and do you have, or do you know if anyone else has sort of a um, sort of more systematic knowledge about, you know, how much do or how do users engage with particular complex escapes? So, so, so I'm, I'm thinking about, for instance, you and Venturini, perhaps others famously mm. made the one, uh, the, the, uh, the, the data escape behind the, mm. doing the tools, the making of law. Yeah. Uh, so, so here, here you could trace sort of the trajectory of laws from parliament to various series of processes into sort of existence in the, in the corpus of, of law, I guess. Um, uh, so, do, do you know anything about? I mean, how have scholars used this, or others have? Uh, yeah. um, how, how how do these things work? I mean, it, yeah. it looks like um, it's it's kind of like you, in a sense, you're building a playground, but it's also interesting what kind of plays play out on 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 that playground. Um, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I don't know any of that. I don't have an example of that has having been studied. Uh, for the case of um, an inquiry into modes of existence, so I was not part of the team, even though I was in the media lab, and so I don't know exactly, but maybe they logged the, the, the actions of the users. Uh, basically, the way you would do that with a digital device is that you would log the actions of the users to then be able to interpret those. It's by itself a complicated endeavor, and by that I mean costly. So companies would do that with A-B testing or other strategies to analyze, for instance, the, the trajectories of users when they buy something to optimize certain aspects. It, it's very costly, so in the research, usually we don't have the, that way of doing it. that. We do log, for instance, and give you a number of small things, but we don't have enough to have the granularity necessary to understanding that finally. You might just get away with observing people interacting with that. That might just be more useful. Mm -hmm. The question is, who is going to pay for that? Because, for instance, when you're already producing the tools, often it's too expensive for you to, in addition to that, observe your users, even if you, you would be the, the most interested in that. Uh, I think that maybe in the field of explainable AI, we may come to that because there is a growing literature about how to uh, make the workings of these systems understandable to an audience so that they can be used in practice. Mm. Because there are literature here, I can imagine there are projects and that's part of it at the fringe of human computer interactions and machine learning, there is money in that space. So I, I could see that. Uh, and it's also possible that this has been done in uh, just the, the fields, the research fields dedicated to that in data visualization in an empirical way. The question that I would have is what are the, uh, the notions they use that look like data scapes or complex escapes? Because the important thing here is that there is no single view that is auto-sufficient. The, the raison d'être of a complex escape is that no, no view can reduce the whole, so you have to navigate through multiple views, else you have no ways of making sense of it. And I think that this concept is not stabilized enough that people would study it directly, but maybe they have studied something that is similar. If in the audience someone knows papers like that, uh, send me an email. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much. Thank you, Torben. Makes me a lot of pleasure.